so good morning, everybody. Um, this is a joint meeting of House Ways and Means and House Education. And the subject that we're going to be looking at over the next hour is the question of how to deal with the 19 um, school districts that haven't yet adopted their budgets, either because they were defeated or because um, they haven't yet been presented to the voters. And um, glad that everybody is able to do this again jointly. Um, seemed to work well last time, so it was good to give it another try. Um, Kate, do you want to say a couple words before we start? Sure. Um, the Senate is, will, will originate a bill. We are working on this at the same time so that we can have agreement between the two bodies uh, before anything leaves. They are working on um, a, a bill that Jim will present today. And um, Janet and I have looked at some other options and some other information that might help us determine the best way to go in this challenging situation. So thank you, Janet. Yeah. Good. So Mark, do you want to get us started? I know you, you and Chloe have been working on some, I've lost you on the screen here. There you go. Um, you and Chloe have been working on some information. So let's, why don't we go ahead and set the stage. Okay, so um, Sorsha, if you can bring up um, the first document that Chloe sent you this morning on the uh, school budgets requiring votes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, great, there it is. So can everybody see that and hear me? Yes? Um, I think so, yeah. Okay, so um, this is a document that um, Chloe Wexler actually put together over the last couple of days um, and included having to go out to some um, websites for um, districts that hadn't posted their, you know, board approved budgets and that kind of stuff. But we, this is the most recent information that we have. There are um, on this list, there are actually 20 districts that don't have budget yet. If you include um, Windham down at the bottom and Rivendell, which was just added recently. So what this table shows you, we'll have to do it in pieces, I guess, for showing it on the screen. Yeah, the, the Mark, the, it's, I don't know if other people are able to see it. It's very tiny, so yeah. it'll take a lot of explanation. Are other people seeing it okay? Yeah, there's a lot of information on here. I think I can direct you to the portions of it that are relevant for you this morning, but, um, and I don't think it's any way to make it any bigger. Sorsha is there at this point. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just lots of explanation will work. Yeah, okay. All right, so there, there are two groups of districts on here. The first group are those districts that have um, simply just not had the opportunity to vote yet because their votes were scheduled after the stay-at-home orders were, or directives were issued. Um, and there are 11 of them. What you can see here is um, the change between FY20 and FY21 in their proposed budgets. Um, and I think you can focus on, I guess, can you see my, can you see my cursor moving around or no? Yes. I can't because I've got the participant list up, but okay. uh, let me see. Okay. Nobody, no, Peter can't see it. I'm looking at other people. I don't. Think okay. So. so out of this initial group of 11, there are two districts that we just don't have any information for because they just haven't gotten to the point yet where they're finalized their board approved budget and those are Granville and Rochester down at the bottom. But for the remaining districts, you can see the percent change between FY20 and FY21 in their budget, their education spending, their pupil count, and their spending per pupil. So this is the column here where you'd wanna focus. It's the uh, change at spending per pupil. And you can see that it ranges from as low as 1.4% in Wyndham Northeast up to about 13.1% in win in uh, the Rivendell Interstate District. So is everybody okay on this so far? It looks like, and I'm checking to see if anybody's raised their hand and I don't see anybody. So it's good. Okay, and you know, this information was provided along this, these lines, even though it's a little bit more detailed than, you know, it would be ideal because districts have changing numbers of pupils which also affects their pupil count. So you can see, for example, um, Wyndham Northeast 
their budget went down by 2.4 percent, but because of the reduction in their equalized pupils, their spending actually goes up by 1.4 percent. So this enables you to see what's driving the growth in per pupil spending, whether it's their budget or loss of pupils. And I don't know if that's helpful to people or not, but the information's there. Um, and then, uh, Sorsha, can you can you page uh, scroll down to the next section? Mark, can I um, just uh, get a clarification? The ed spending per pupil is the figure that um, that uh, affects the local tax rate. They they percent the well the local tax rates, right? That's right. So that's, that's right. the critical figure for taxes. That's true. Yes. For the allocation of taxes. Right. That, that the education spending per pupil is what we determine tax rates on. Yeah. Difference between the budget and education spending is the categorical aid that comes out from the feds and the state, yeah. plus some other things that are districts are able able to use to reduce their education spending. So if you drop down to this next section, the, this is an additional nine districts that were able to. Um, set their board approved budgets and get them in front of the voters, but they were defeated. Two of them were associated with bond issues, um, Slate Valley and South Burlington, but the others just went down. And in this case, you can see that the um, per pupil spending increases ranged from a high of 16% down to about 2.3%. So all 20 of these districts have increased budgets um, but they range from quite a quite a bit, and you know you got to keep in mind this is a really mixed bag of districts. Wyndham, which has the biggest increase, for example, has a very small number of kids. It's a district with 18 kids in it, so you know one or two kids makes a big swing in the in the percentage. So um, although there's a lot of information on this sheet, it's there to sort of help you navigate these kind of questions because. When I first look at this and see a 16% increase, I think, oh my God, that's that's just huge. How did that happen? And you realize that, you know, it can be attributable in a district that size to adding a kid or two. To yeah. your, to your uh, Peter Conlon has a question. Yeah, and I apologize if I'm jumping the gun here. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you know, Mark, if um, Slate South Burlington in their budgets, did it include their bond payments? Oh, I, I don't believe it did because I, I think that the bond the bond payments wouldn't have started to kick in until we beyond kick FY21. In. Yeah. Okay. So um, that was that was a proposal to approve the bond. Okay. The, you know, the yeah, next and, 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 be, and, okay. And just yeah. a clarification in the first group, uh, you talked about how spending was going up, but what you really meant was spending per pupil was going up because in some of these towns, spending is actually going down or would be if they're budgets had been approved. That, that's true. And again, and again, that's that's the that's the interplay between your budget and the number of equalized pupils you have. So again, I think with the one district I flagged that jumped out at me was um, Wyndham Northeast, which is number four on that list, which has an increase in education spending per pupil, even though they've reduced their budget by two and a half percent. So right, but, it, but they're but they're looking for presumably fewer state dollars to fund their education. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, um, I, you know, there's a lot of information on this sheet. What's, what, what's in the columns to the right are the uh, FY 2020 figures, um, the year we're currently in. FY 21 shows you what was initially warned or proposed um, I'm happy to answer any questions on this. I know Chloe's online. Um, she put this together so she could also answer any questions that you might have for it related to this. But I mean, this is, this is basically just where we are. Um, these districts do not yet have budgets. There are default budgets in the law. There's the proposal that you're going to hear later on from Jim about how to um, set a default budget as an, an alternative default budget to the, to the one we have right now in current law. And um, I'm not sure what else I can do on this sheet, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Um, Mark, the, the um, you probably already said this, but is, is the sheet divided between the districts that rejected their budgets and the districts that just haven't 
had a vote yet? Yes, the first 11 districts listed okay. on the sheet are those districts that haven't, haven't had a vote at all. And the next nine districts are those that have had um, their budgets presented before their voters, but they were rejected. Okay. Nine yeah. rejections, nine rejections needed, and 11 yep. that just haven't voted yet. Okay, I just needed to read it through more closely. Sorry, George. Yep. George, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I'm <clears throat> using two computers and grabbed the wrong mouse to try to mute me. Um, Mark, the, the very last one on the um, second, the bottom part of the list, Wyndham, it says non member elementary, West River. Um, does that mean that? They declined to um, to merge. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I suspect that Chloe does if she wants to jump in, or maybe Jim Damore if he's on. I don't know, um, but it's it's a really tiny district. It's only 18, 18 pupils. Yeah, and then the follow up is there, there are others on this list that were asked to merge and didn't. Yeah, we, we could take a look at that, um, but um, I don't know off the top of my head which which of these had the opportunity to merge and declined. Jim um, might know that. I, yeah, I <laughs> asked Jim to also answer the question about why Wyndham is, oh, I see, got it. Okay, go ahead, Jim. <laughs> I answer my own question. Jim, can you help us with that? Or so. You, you muted. Uh, Jim, you're muted. Sue could here. probably answer that as well. Okay. Yeah, here I'm. I'm here as well. This is Chloe okay. Wexler. Yeah. Um, so I, um, from the Joint Fiscal Office, for the record, um, just confirming that yes, Windham is a non-member elementary of the West River Unified Elementary District, which is. Um, they have the vote has not occurred for that district and Wyndham did have their vote and it was defeated. Um, I had a question a minute ago. I guess it's on. Caleb. Caleb. Yeah, Caleb. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, just uh, offer a little context on Wyndham. We did hear from some folks from Wyndham. It is a small district. Uh, I believe that the they are part of a supervisory district, but not, not part of a merged district. Um, and um, so that, that was just, I, I, I know that they had some uh, unanticipated and for their size, extraordinary costs related to um, special ed costs and reimbursements and some complexities. But anyway, just to, they, we did hear from them and I think it is correct that they submitted an alternative governance structure. I can't remember whether it was, went, one way or the other, but um, essentially they're not merged in a district. They're they're sort of a, a small elementary district that's attached and under that supervisory structure. So, to the extent that's helpful, that's what I remember from when we heard from some of uh, members of that board and community. Uh, other questions? Anyone has? Um, Bill, are you trying to ask, throw something in? Yeah, go ahead. So, well, Mark was talking about the fall budgets in the current law, just to make sure it's clear that the law says that if you don't pass a budget, you have to keep voting. Um, and you will, on the three payment dates, uh, September, December, and April, get a quarter of the ed spending amount. So you get, And then you have the borrowing provision after that that allows you to borrow an amount that'll give you 87% of the total budget. But there's, So there's really no default budget current in current law. There's only that provision. You have to keep voting. Unless we do something different, which is what we're Unless you planning change. Yeah. to do. Yeah, or do something special for this year when people actually can't vote. Um, so I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host. Oh. oh, hi, Kate. <laughs> Just jump in. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at uh, the list that Brad had where he showed the, um, the failed votes and then I think uh, six of them had developed new budgets. Do you know if the others have actually developed new budgets that they had intended to put to toward the voters, but didn't didn't have time to do that? Um, I, if you're asking me, I, I don't know, no, we don't know that. 
It was Albert uh, Stratford, Stratford um, Harwood were, were ones that I see um, that did not have, it doesn't, doesn't look like they've got any other draft that they were putting before the voters. Maybe that's a question for Sue. She might know when, when it comes her time. Yeah, yeah, or, or maybe for Chloe. I mean, this, this is a point in time. I mean, I, I know in order to complete this sheet that Chloe had to go to the um, web, web pages of some of these districts in order to find out what their board approved budget was when it wasn't submitted. And there could be changes in the individual districts or things that are progressing that we're not aware of. But this was the most recent information we had available. Um, and the other, the other thing I just wanted to raise is, um, and this is in response to uh, Bill's comments. Um, my understanding is that if districts decide to set their budgets after June 30th, when tax rates need to be set, they would have to issue new bills. Is that correct, Bill? So that, that's, a, that's a big deal for a district and a consideration that they may want to weigh. Oh, oh. So that connects to what the Senate proposed. Yes. Got it. Okay. I mean, they, they have to, they, they give a tax rate that's the base rate. I don't want to know, remember how you do that with a yield, but then they have to send a dollar. A dollar. Yeah. Okay. And then you send an additional tax rate based on whatever you finally get to raise the, the additional funds. Okay. Uh, Kate, do you think it makes sense to um, uh, go to Sue at this point or what? what is your preference? I, I think so. I think um, I continue to be interested in how far the districts were getting uh, in their in their process um, before we come sort of flying in with a big solution. Um, so I'm interested in what the status is on the ground in terms of progress on budgets. So perhaps we, we, we can go to Sue. Thank you. So it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to testify this morning uh, regarding school budgets. And um, we're focusing today on the 19 school districts without approved budgets for fiscal year 21. And uh, Mar Mark has just outlined who those districts are. We know that Governor Scott issued the stay home, stay, stay safe order on March 24th, 2020, and that that order has been extended to May 15th. 2020, the Secretary of State has issued guidance stating that elections scheduled for April and May should be canceled, if at all possible. And so under these circumstances, then the school districts without approved budgets are facing great uncertainty about when and how their budget votes can occur, and also uncertainty about the ability to see a budget approved in the current economic crisis. The VSBA is calling for an approach that would provide these districts without that don't have uh, approved FY 2021 budgets with legislatively granted spending authority for FY 2021 equivalent to their FY 2020 approved ed spending plus an inflator of the statewide percent increase in ed spending, which is approximately 4%. If a district has already presented a budget to voters that is less than that authorized by this proposal, the default budget should be their proposed budget. Districts with significant increases in equalized pupils should be addressed by a special exception clause to allow the default budget increase to account for this factor. And you can see which ones those are on the chart that uh, Mark just talked about. In addition, VSBA supports extending the June 30 deadline for these districts to present proposed budgets to their electorate. The worsening economy and potential legislative response to the resulting shortfall in the Ed Fund is likely to lead to severe pressures on all districts to not stabilize these 19 districts with reasonable spending authority will disadvantage them as they work to navigate this crisis. Draft Bill 20-1 excuse me, draft bill 20-0955 version 1.1, which provides FY 2021 default spending authority equal. So I'm going to interrupt just to clarify that that's what the Senate is looking at, right? Yes. That's yes. not a bill we have in front of us at this point. That's the one that the Senate is looking at. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And I believe you'll be looking at it later this morning. We will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
I just I just want people to know that there's not a draft that our committee or house said is worked up at this point. Yes. So that draft bill has spending authority equal to FY 2020 approved education spending, um, which is level funding. Um, and we believe that that would disadvantage these 19 um, districts or 20 as set forth in um, in the information Mark just gave you because uh, the West River modified district was divided into two on the information that Mark just presented. Last week, the Vermont Superintendents Association hosted a meeting of the superintendents of the 19 affected districts. And I participated in that meeting. And then on Wednesday of this week, uh, VSA and VSBA hosted superintendents and board chairs of the affected districts in a virtual meeting. 13 of the 14 representative superintendents were present and 14 of the 19 school board chairs were in attendance. Overwhelmingly, superintendents and board chairs expressed the dire consequences of a default budget based on level funded education spending. For most, version 1.1 of the bill would cause a substantial shortfall requiring a significant reduction in force and or cuts to programs and services. They are gravely concerned about their school's ability to address the increased and very significant needs of students returning to school in the fall with a de decreased workforce. The magnitude of this once in a lifetime crisis has shown us how heavily our society relies on our schools as hubs of our communities to provide social services well beyond traditional education. These services are in jeopardy in the 19 affected districts if default budgets are level funded based on FY 2020 education spending. An inflator is critical because it addresses at least partially the increased costs school districts have every year in the area of salaries and benefits. It is particularly important in FY 2021 because the arbitrator's decision in statewide bargaining for health insurance for school employees goes into effect during FY 2021. According to an expert witness, the arbitrator's choice of the employee commissioner's last best offer will result in approximately 25 million of additional cost, which will be approximately 10% of the overall cost of healthcare benefits for educational employees. This figure does not reflect the annual increase in premium costs for health plans. The 25 million reflects an additional cost above and beyond the 14% increase in healthcare premium rates for FY 2021. Providing a default budget without an inflator in a year where there will be such significant increases in the costs of providing healthcare benefits would be devastating to nearly all of the 19 districts. One superintendent captured the dire consequences of level funding this way. Students will be returning to their schools with nothing but bare bones education. No field trips, no extracurriculars, and minimal enrichment and support at the very time these kids are going to need it the most. This will be especially evident in districts in rural communities and those with high proportions of economically disadvantaged families. Simply put, Equity in educational opportunity will not be addressed, but will instead be tremendously exacerbated. Finally, I want to be clear on behalf of the board chairs and superintendents with whom we have been working, as well as for the Vermont School Boards Association, that we are not seeking any unnecessary dispensation or special advantage for these 19 districts. On the contrary, our goal is to see these districts placed on comparatively equal footing with those districts that saw budgets approved before the onslaught of operational challenges and fiscal deterioration resulting from the COVID-19 crisis. These districts have been subject to the same challenges of every other district in Vermont in the early days of navigating this crisis, and they will be striving to serve children and communities in the same diminished economy under the same state and federal policies that are established to contend with this tragic event. On behalf of these districts and the students and communities they serve, I ask your consideration in putting them on stable financial ground as they work to navigate the long and challenging road ahead. Thank you. 
I thank you very much. And just to let the committee know that your testimony is posted on our website if people want to go back and refer to it. Um, so I, I'm going to, oh, Kate has a question, then I'll wait. Go ahead. Um, yeah. When I look at this list, there's very little that these different districts have in common. I mean, they're only on this list because of voting. Um, Wyndham has very little relationship to South Burlington, which has very little relationship to Harwood. And, and I'm also looking at the range of spending per pupil ranging from looks like 1.4 to 16%. I'm, I'm wondering if this needs a more surgical uh, instrument rather than just a broad 4% that's easy and swift, but doesn't really get to what the districts were contemplating. Just your thoughts on that. Well, you are right that they are that there are um, there are differences and and each of these situations is unique um, there. We may be able to take a look at um, at the data. Some, some of this is that having all of this in front of us is very, very helpful. And um, we may be able to take a look at it and, and group some of them together um, and, and take an approach that is um, more targeted. Um, but uh, the, the information that I have from JFO is that um, the, the increase um, the inflator, the 4% inflator is already baked into their modeling and projections um, and that that would not necessarily um, move the needle up um, on the statewide average. So that's a factor to consider as well. So, so the, the question I was going to ask is why, why wouldn't we use the budgets that are proposed by the boards, the school boards in each instance? That's, that's certainly another approach. Um, there, there are some uh, that have budgets that are proposed that are uh, lower than, than the state right. average uh, at spending. And there are some that are um, higher as well. I mean, it just strikes me that the school boards probably have a better idea of what's needed than, than I do. Um, yes. For sure. Uh, anyway, but just throwing that out there is a different way of thinking about this and that five people. Robin, Emily, Jim, Joey, and Sarita. So Robin, you go ahead. Thanks, thank you, um, Sue. You've answered some of my questions already. Um, I'm wondering if, um, are we the first group you've presented this, oh, I'm sorry, 4% um, to, or did the Senate also hear this and what was their reaction? The Senate also, we did also um, provide testimony to the Senate uh, and they, decided to uh, go forward with a uh, with with this proposal uh, we I, I should say we provided them proposal? with a memo yes with, with which proposal so the, the proposal that you are going to hear about uh, after I think it's right after me okay so the one without an inflator at all yes okay yeah. thank you uh, Emily thanks I'm curious about um, I'm concerned about our ability to have enough information to be surgical, and um, I appreciate and I appreciate the idea of existing budgets, but wonder if that works with sort of the failed districts. And I'm curious if it's possible, even, or what districts would think of us allowing them to do this on their own um, and just giving the authority to them temporarily in this emergency. You mean to the school boards? The or? school boards, so that the boards that know that sort of their budget might need to shift slightly in these times would be able to do that, and those who um, feel like they have the confidence of the voters to keep on spending could do that. I think one of the concerns that I have heard is that uh, they really right now don't know when they're going to be able to hold a vote. They're waiting for information from the Secretary of State's office um, about the option of having a, a vote by mail. Right now, that's not, um, that's not really an, uh, a good option because it, re under current law, 
ballots have to be requested in order to be mailed. They don't just automatically get mailed to every single voter. So they're, they're, I, I think districts are concerned about the ability to, um, to pass the budget that they need in this economic climate, but also concerned about um, how their election vote is actually gonna be conducted. I guess I meant giving them the authority to do it without a vote just this one time in this emergency. I understand. Okay, thank right. you. Yeah. So um, what I, think oh, I interrupted somebody, but I don't know who. Well, or somebody. It was me just, I'm curious about what a clarification, with that clarification, what do you think the districts would think of that? So what you're asking is what, what they would think about uh, be, their default budget being the budget that they proposed yeah. or what or that they would propose that they would propose okay uh, I I would like I'd probably like to get some feedback from them about that that's not something that we have discussed um, but it certainly is uh, it, that could be an option uh, Jim, Joey, Sarita. Yeah, um, at the moment I'm in favor of doing something. Um, the inflator seems like a reasonably good option at this point in time. Um, Kate asked the question of could we do something more surgical and I'm wondering of the practicality of doing that and um, whether it would make things better or just more complicated. I'm being a little sarcastic, cynical today, but I apologize for that. Um, uh, the, um, the idea of putting in, in an inflator um, doesn't assure that all the schools would spend all that much money. They still have voters to contend with. They still have elected school boards and, and, um, and that is basically the way we generally do things. So I am tending in that direction um, unless we can think of something else that is plenty straightforward. Um, everybody understands it and it's not too convoluted. Thank you. Uh, Joey. Hear me? We can now. Okay, I'm okay. Um, my answer, my question was covered, thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Sarita and then Scott. I'm wondering about the federal funds from the CARES Act. I mean, how is that in play in terms of that going through the agency to the schools? What are the guidelines for that? And um, is that at play at all in kind of looking at the solution? I think that is in play in looking at the solution. Um, probably Mark has some information about uh, that. I, I know I uh, heard Secretary French testify yesterday, and uh, it sounded like the agency is um, waiting for more information um, about those funds and and determining how those are going to be distributed. Um, but I do know that they are going through; uh, they're not going into the education fund. Right, I know. <laughs> But if Mark is still on, he might be able to provide a little bit more information about that. If it's okay, I can just jump in. Um, there's, there's $27 million available. That money, the distribution of that money is dictated by the Title I allocations. So the state doesn't have control as to how that money goes out to individual supervisory unions. But um, how it might affect the Ed Fund or not, if we can get creative, I, we just don't know at this point. We don't know if it's going to show up in FY20 or FY21. And we also don't know if that money is going to be used to offset some of the additional costs that school districts may have occurred during this last part of the school year in terms of providing the other services that we've asked them to do. So that's all up in the air, I think. Thank you. Uh, Scott, back. Yeah, I, I may have missed this, and if I did, I apologize. But has the on this plan to uh, for dollars for the districts that have not voted, has the secretary weighed in on that? I don't think he has weighed in in testimony on that. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. He has not reported in on any specific plan. Um, I would also just I apologize for the word surgical. I think that got us to the wrong <laughs> the wrong direction. It really probably meant more personal in, in more other nuanced. words. Yeah. Yes. In yeah. other words, Wyndham that has 16 students has a 16% increase, or they're now they're going to a 15. That would be what they would get. This South Burlington that has 4,000 students, they have a 4.4 increase. You get that until you vote. That that's your that's your budget until you vote, which is at least something that that the um, district said the school boards are considered. The only challenge I have, uh, Sue, is that we're missing uh, whether some of these districts, Alberg, Stratford, um, when uh, Harwood had actually come up with with uh, new budgets. On the other hand, if the if what we do is push the decision to the school boards, which is what Emily was talking about, then they'll have to, whether they've done it now or not. Um, and I, you know, I'll just weigh in. I I would feel much more comfortable if we're going to impose a budget that we impose a budget that's been developed locally. Um, I just not comfortable trying to pull a number out of the air that, um, that we think represents what they need. And the only thing that we have that's been developed locally are the proposed budgets, um, or if a budget's been defeated, whatever the school board would come up with as an alternative. Um, that's, I don't know how else to do it locally. I think that's sort of what Emily was putting out there. So if, if it would be possible for you to go back and think through a construct like that, I think that would be useful for us. Um, I don't think a flat percentage makes sense when you look at the range of percentages, whatever, whatever flat percentage it, it is, whether it's inflation or something else that we've dreamed up. Um, but I think, I think it ought to be more um, individualized. Is that the right word, Kate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Peter, Kathleen, and Caleb. Thanks. Oh, um, uh, my internet, my internet cut out. Uh, uh, so um, when we were talking about a four percent, that was a four percent increase in the bottom line spending proposal. It was a four percent increase on Ed spending. On Ed spending. Okay. I'm just looking at because if it was a budget increase, we've yeah. got some who are proposing eight percent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was fully understanding um, Emily's suggestion, um, but I, I will just weigh in that it, if the idea would be to give school boards the opportunity just this one time in an emergency to go ahead without a taxpayer vote, um, I, I don't think that would go over very well with the taxpayers. And um, that's probably not something that I'd get behind. Thanks. Let's see if there's anyone else wants to jump in. I guess I guess if I can jump in the the reason why I uh, prefer that if if we can't get voters to vote, I would rather do that than have us decide. It's really, you know, we're not in a we're not in a situation where we get to do the best choice, um, which is frankly to have taxpayers weigh in. Uh, Robin, George, and Caleb. Um, thanks. So on the same topic, I thought I heard one of you say, give them their budget that they have proposed until the voters actually get a chance to vote on it. So maybe they could start the year with that budget and then ultimately vote. I don't know if that's too crazy or not, but um, as opposed to voting for the whole year. Um, I don't know if I'm clear, explaining myself, but could they, could they vote say in September that they go ahead with the budget as proposed and then if they vote in September, they might have to do some backtracking around. What well, they let Mark weigh in on that, but there are timing issues with tax bills right. that um, I think right. would be more challenging than the okay. benefit we would get from okay. it. But, um, but Mark, do you want to? Well, just it would, it would require reissuing tax bills, um, which is a, a hassle for the towns. But it, you know, it could it could be done. But yeah. and some towns do that every year. But it's yeah. a big deal. 
uh, George, Caleb, Larry, Scott. So looking at Mark's list, we have two groups. We have the group who hasn't voted yet. And for them, it, to me, it makes sense to, even though taxpayers might not like it, it makes sense to me for that group that, that we go with the proposed budget. Then we have a group where people have voted no um, for a budget. Um, and in that group, it kind of makes sense to me to have the school boards propose, make a new uh, budget proposal um, to go with rather than one that has already been defeated by the voters. Yeah, and, that, and that's basically what we've asked Sue to go back and see what people's reaction is and understanding Kathleen that, um, that there, there are certainly people on the two committees who um, are not happy with that outcome, but it's worth looking at anyway. Uh, Caleb, Larry, and Scott. Will you yeah, try to jump in, Mark? I, I think that uh, really my point was going to be along the same lines as George, so I can probably not make it. But but just that idea that that we really are looking at the, the really big difference between scheduled votes that never got a chance uh, and votes that were defeated. And if they were defeated, and if something was developed locally that they were going to take back to voters as a second draft, that's very different. But yeah, just that to uh <laughs> yeah to even for a short term put into place a budget that was voted down as a as a non-starter yeah and i i, I would just jump in to say that uh, in south burlington's case for example they have done a re um, evaluation of their budget had a date scheduled for voters to you know to weigh in on that and had to have that vote postponed so in some cases school boards have recrafted their budgets. They just haven't been able to get in, get them in front of their budgets. So that information may be available in most districts. Larry, Scott, Bill. Yeah, I just, I, I just need a little clarity. Um, if we use the inflator, if we do the inflator, um, that will not require a vote. Is, am I correct? Nothing that we're talking about is requiring a vote because they can't. So, um, well, I guess, okay, I guess that pretty much answers my question. Thank you. Uh, Robin had an idea of voting later, but there's nothing that we can require that would happen before July 1. Thank you. Scott, Bill. Yeah, I actually, um, I would like to explore Robin's idea a little bit more. I think that that um, is doable. Um, I think if they did ask for more money than the, um, the estimate that they were given, that we're not talking about huge, huge sums of money. And those could be, you know, rolled into their calculation for FY22. So they wouldn't pay the tax rate this year, they'd pay it in the, the next year. Uh, I think the Ed Fund can, as a self-balancing fund, can, could do that. And I think it would preserve the local control, which I think is is very important at these at this time for these districts. Uh, Bell, Canfield. Yeah, I look forward to hearing back from Sue. Consider a district whose budget failed that was less generous than the four percent. Okay. So, yeah, I look forward to hearing back. Yeah. Are, are you saying you would rather go with the? with a proposed or an alternative budget than a 4% inflator. Yeah, I'd like to see if the if the districts have proposed their next budget. Yeah. 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 Scott. Yeah, to, to that point by Bill, if, if that in fact was the case for a district, then they would effectively have a reserve, they would have reserve money that they could apply to FY22 and lower their tax bill in the next year if that if that came to pass. It was not like they would lose the money. Other, uh, Bill, you're back on. Yeah, well, Scott, where's this money coming from that they're gonna be able to keep for another year? I'm back. Well, it would just, it would, it would come out of the Ed Fund and um, it would certainly, you know, it all floats, it, it's a self-balancing fund. 
But in the end, if the district pays a, a tax rate for the funds that they took, then it makes the ed fund as whole as it would have been. Just It just occurs over two years instead of one. Emily. Um, I just wanna add that while um, I don't think any of the proposals that we're gonna be able to do are going to be the ideal will of the voters because the voters won't be able to express their, vil their will. Um, I think by looking to the school boards rather than our decision-making will be at least closer to the voters um, because it's those are the people that the voters selected to make those decisions. And that's sort of, for me, like as close as we can get to the type of democracy we want in this situation, even though it's not, I, I mean, nothing about right now is ideal. Uh, Peter, Anthony. I would, I would just uh, uh, remind everybody, if the uh, uh, folks who have no budget, if their voters get a chance uh, belatedly to vote, whether it's in uh, November or uh, sooner, uh, they have the privilege of knowing uh, what's afoot in the economy, which of course puts those kids, and after all, we're talking about students' education, it's my old problem with taxpayer equity versus student equity. We are really uh, acting on behalf of the students, albeit in the, in the most just manner, respecting the taxpayers' participation. So I just think we're talking about two groups, one who know what's happening with the recession and those who don't know or didn't know when they voted. Thank you. It, it's, um, it's your point that um, if voters uh, with that knowledge, they're less likely to vote an adequate budget. Is that what you're saying? I, I, that's usually that's the pattern the in my community, yes. Okay, just want to be clear. Caleb. Thank you. Um, yeah, following up on Peter's point, I think um, there is a difference potentially in, in what voters are, are inclined to vote for now is what they would have been, you know, prior to, to the revenue shortfall that we're seeing. And also just specifically the yield, which I know we'll be talking about. Um, we have to be very careful when we sign voters up for a budget they haven't explicitly authorized, um, particularly going into a year where we know, I think close to know that revenue shortfalls will be a, a reality to, and we, we've talked more about the specifics of that for the year ending uh, June 30th. We've talked less about it for the year beginning July 1st, but um, I just think that we have to bear in mind that we have taken some testimony that would suggest there could be some really um, big impacts on uh, property, the property tax portion of, of, of school funding. And so I, I think that keeping that in mind in this whole conversation is really critical. And I know there's some provisions on the books, or I think there are for, you know, if you don't pass a budget, you can borrow up to 87% of the previous budget, something like that, knowing that it could get you through, you know, the first quarter or two of operation might be good because then you really could have a better chance of getting voters in person to vote on a, on a real, budget that's more informed by what we see with revenues and everything. Um, sorry if that's poorly expressed, but basically I, I'm just wanting to bring up the point that we would need to really be very hesitant to even sign voters up for a flat budget of what they've had before, given the new environment um, and uh, the revenue shortfalls and, and just to Peter's previous point. Um, so thanks. So a couple more um... Questions or thoughts, Scott and George? I, I just like to, um, and this is probably not politically correct, but that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna push back on the paradigm a little bit that at this point in time, or I'm not, probably not talking this point in time in a month or two, that it is going to be impossible to vote. Um, there's mail-in voting, there's, we, anybody could do curbside. I mean, there are a lot of ways that a district could organize a vote so that people can do it safely, maintain their distances. And I think that um, we're giving up on the, that idea that they could actually vote a little too easily. George. Um, you know, the, 
we really don't know how long this is going to go on at the current level, but it looks like it's going to be a while, quite a while. And so I, I would not bank on people being able to vote, you know, sometime soon enough to get tax bills out to people. Um, the other thing is, having sat on a board where we've had a budget defeated a couple of times, so we're getting to that point of looking at an 87% of the you know, past year's budget as, as what we would be operating with, you don't have the luxury of saying this might get better later. You have to act like it's going to be 87%, which means a bunch of layoffs. Now, um, you just can't count on that, you know, that later on something will, good will happen. And, and so I'd be very hesitant to, to leave boards and districts in that position, because I think it's a prescription for a real disaster. Um, there's no more hands, I'm gonna jump in. Uh, you know, the point that I think Peter was making, if I understood it, was that um, most districts have voted under uh, the world as it used to be. Um, and we've got a group of districts here, if we hold a vote, who are gonna be voting under the world as it is now. And um, those kids are not getting the same um, kind of, um, the decisions about their education are not being made in the same environment. And there's an equity issue, I think, that arises with that, that I hadn't thought about a whole lot before, but I think it's an important one. Anyone else want to weigh in? Doesn't look like it. I'll just add that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that um, I was looking for something that that was more uh, individualized, and I think the idea of passing it back to the boards um, works. Um, I think that 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 is a cleaner way uh, to address this issue, and it also um, keeps us out of a. I, I, I think it's I think it's an appropriate way to go. Robin. Thanks. I was going to say the um, the same thing. I think it's, uh, you know, as Emily said, it's, it's the closest thing we get to the voters by having the school boards. They've done all the work. They know better than we do. And I do worry about um, our students and them um, getting the same opportunities that they would if they'd been able to vote, um, you know, under the old, in the old world order. In the so, old world, I, the old world um, order. Yeah. yeah. I'm inclined to go to agree with that as well. Thanks. We will be inviting the superintendents in next week uh, to talk to us. And it would be nice if we had some an idea that we could present to them that we're thinking about. Um, so uh, that's a good idea. Um, I um, We haven't actually gotten to the point of presenting the Senate bill, but I'm not sensing that there's a lot of support in this group of two committees um, for that. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll throw out the idea of at least asking Jim to draft something along the lines of what we've been talking about. Also ask Sue to talk to the affected towns and her members. And um, the uh, final thought is if there, I don't know what time you're meeting, Kate, but if there are members of this committee who want to participate or listen in, whichever, however you want to do that, um, I'd like to, I don't know that we need to do the meeting jointly necessarily, but I'd like to keep the connection between the two committees on this if I can. Avery, it would be great if you could just include an invitation to the Ways and Means members when we set that meeting, which it's either going to be, I believe, Tuesday or Friday. Great. Okay. Sam, you had your hand up a minute ago. Are you all set? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we wouldn't want to pass budgets that were higher than ones that had already been defeated just because the board came up with a new budget, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it, right. I mean, it, it may be what I was thinking is it'd be maybe if all of the budget, the new budgets were actually proposed and we could like pass them as a slate at the state level. I don't know. Trying to think about it. Mm -hmm. Or we could say whatever alternative you come up with, but no higher than the defeated one. Yeah. But I mean, they, I assume that's usually why they get defeated, not because they're too low. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> it might be my district. Anyway, sorry that. 
one one more. Uh, so, and we've got to shift, shift gears because we're going we've got a, another agenda at eleven, but we've got another minute or two. Uh, I'm hearing um, a lot from my town manager in Colchester about the municipality's ability now that our budget is passed to be able to collect these taxes now that people you know, don't have jobs and have very limited income. And I, I just want to say that I think the municipalities are going to have to make up that money somehow either or be penalized if they can't make those payments. So I think this, I'm just advocating a little bit in terms of the fallout on municipalities that did pass their budgets. Yeah, Sarita, um, maybe you can clarify for me, but I think Colchester has already collected all its all its property tax installments. Um, I think to for July first. Yeah, right? yeah, uh, just for not, fiscal, not, not for fiscal twenty. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is going to have a problem in fiscal twenty one, but the yeah. ones that haven't collected have a different problem. But Colchester, I think, has already collected all of its money. Right. Yeah. Uh, Peter Anthony. Uh, just uh, to, to uh, uh, carry on what uh, Sam was uh, talking about, I think it would be very dangerous if we um, insisted or allowed a school board to propose a budget that was even equal to, never mind higher, than one that was defeated. Well, the, the only exceptions that I can think of, but South Burlington has already done an alternative, maybe a Slate Valley has too, but the, those two budgets went down mostly because of those bonds that were uh, next to them. So it's hard, hard to second guess. My feeling is that the school board is going to have to answer to its voters um, for what it does. So um, all but three have proposed budgets, and those three may have proposed budgets yeah, as, well. as well. I just don't know what they yeah. are. So it's just about 11. We haven't heard from Jim. I, I'm sensing that we probably don't need to, but Kate, what do you think? Um, what, what's your pleasure? The, the only thing I thought, thought would be is interesting is they had a whole thing on the timing. So we're talking about not just a default budget. We're just saying, here's your, bud here's your budget. We're not talking about a default that you're, the voters are gonna be voting on later they had a default budget with the opportunity to vote later. I know a couple of people, at least on my committee, I'm not sure about yours, would, would like to think about a subsequent vote. Um, I don't know whether that can you know, be a piece of whatever we end up looking at so that we have, I don't know if there's two versions or something. I, I'm, I have some misgivings about it, but, um, but I, I've heard people say that they'd like to see something. So it, it's it's up to the committee if they want to hear the Senate bill. I can so we can certainly do it in our committee. Yeah, I, I've got witnesses at eleven on a different subject, um, so I'm, I'll have to shift gears shortly. But uh, Jim, did you? Yeah, want to just uh, without walking through the bill, just to mention, make sure the committees are aware that the bill does not mandate or impose a budget upon school districts. It gives them another option. So allows them to approve their own budget or revote their own budget or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, the difference of opinion here between Rep Beck and Rep Till in terms of the ability uh, is very relevant in terms of whether they can actually use that ability to revote or, or to vote. But just to mention that that's, the vote does not impose a default budget, it just gives them the option of using one. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Janet, for uh, organizing this with you together. And um, we aren't done yet, but we will. We will hear. We're done with this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Um, we'll stay in touch, and um, we'll keep inviting Peter to join us when we meet, and um, and maybe we can participate in your next meeting. Great. Some of us anyway. Thank you very much. Well, so, Sorsha, you're going to uh, shut this off. And uh, uh, for ways and means, don't go away. Um, we're going to be right back on in a minute. We're just going to do this in two segments. So, she's going to stop the live stream and then start it back up. Okay. I'm going to end the live stream on the join hearing now.
Okay, this is the House Education Committee at the Bond House of Representatives on April 17th, and we are looking at a draft bill related to delaying the implementation of Act 173. Um, Jim, can you speak to us about that? The current draft that is, the Senate is looking at right now, is that correct? Correct. And um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so for the record, uh, Jim Damore, Ledge Consul, Avery, did you post the um, the chart, uh, the spread, spread, the chart that shows? Um, let me look at this. I believe that we reviewed a chart like that in a testimony last week. Um, I updated this for this week, actually. Um, it's, it's, in the Senate. it's in the Senate website, so maybe you could pull that up, Avery. Yeah, could you? That'd be great. I'll pull it up, just a moment. Okay, terrific, thank you. Okay, so on this chart, um, let me just get rid of the pictures of people so I can see the chart. Okay, um, this chart shows in red the changes that are being made in the draft we're about to go through. So just to reorient us as to what this chart does, is the timeline for implementation of Act 173. And if you pause, uh, if you look at the um, boxes here uh, where it says fiscal 19, fiscal 20 across the page there, originally when um, 173 was passed, the census grant would have started in fiscal year, fiscal year 21. That's the third box in. And then last year, um, that was delayed by one year to fiscal year 22. Um, uh, that was delayed in the Budget Act. And now uh, we're talking about delaying it further to fiscal year 23. So keeping on those boxes for a minute, what we're saying here is that the first year of the grant funding would be fiscal year 23. Um, and remember that that first year of grant funding is um, an average of what uh, supervisory unions received in fiscal, year, in fiscal years um, 18, 19, and 20, plus an inflator. So um, the, the, the uh, fiscal years here, 18, 19, and 20, have been updated in the draft to those dates from fiscal year 17, 18, and 19. So we move those dates forward a year in, 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 in the draft. Uh, but whatever those years are, they are inflated. So um, they will get a, a, a amount of funding in fiscal year 23 that essentially equals their historical level of funding um, for special education. The next year, uh, fiscal year 24, 25, and 26, that's three years, is the transition period moving to the uniform um, uh, base amount uh, in fiscal year 27. So again, it's kind of confusing, but let's go to the end, end here, fiscal 27. They start with, in fiscal 23, with you know, grant funding that they historically received. But in 27, they're, they're getting funding based on a uniform base amount multiplied by their um, average daily membership. So they have 100 students, for example, that's for ADM. They're going to multiply it by a uniform amount. Uh, everybody will be using the same uniform base amount. So it'll be the same, it'll be on the same uh, platform. Um, and um, that calculation is basically the average of fiscal years 18, 19, and 20 uh, funding uh, plus an inflator. Uh, so that's what the uniform base amount will be then. So remember that in fiscal 2023, 20, 20, 20, when we start, um, the, the funding amounts per student are all over the map because um, this, uh, school. Uh, supervisory unions are getting what they historically got. 
divided by the number of students. So what they got historically will differ by SU, the number of students will differ by SU. So in 23, um, the spending per student, the grant per student will be very different per SU. By 2027, they'll be the same. And in between, we're moving toward that uniform base rate. So wherever you are in 23, you're moving toward using the uniform base rate in, uh, in, in 27. I know that's confusing, especially for people who weren't there when this was all put together, but that's how these, uh, the process works broadly. The other dates have been changed in the bill we're about to go through. If you look up uh, where it says SBE rules adopted, originally that was in, in 173, those rules had to be adopted uh, by November 1st, uh, 2019. Last year it was changed to August 1, 2020. And now we're moving it forward by a year to August 1, 2021. And then lastly, at the very bottom of the page, uh, there are rules in 173, F 173, that require certain uh, approved independent schools to accept students on IEP. Uh, originally, that was uh, set to come in force uh, in fiscal year 22. Um, uh, uh, sorry, fiscal year 23, and that's being moved to fiscal year 24. Um, so, okay, so that's the chart. Before I go on, are there any questions on the timeline? Just if on the bottom, the independent schools, it looks yeah. like it's FY22 instead of FY24. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, originally, I'm having trouble seeing that actually. Uh, yeah, so originally it was FY22, um, and now it's been moved to FY24. Okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. Um, so if we can go, uh, Avery, to the bill itself. Ah. Okay, so I, I see now uh, that the um, the timeline we, we just went through is incorrect um, because the independent school requirements are moving from fiscal from, from July one twenty two to July one twenty three. So I have to fix that in the in the timeline. Apologies for that. Okay, so we have the bill there. Um, this bill uh, proposes to do two, two things, uh, delay the change in special education funding uh, from reimbursement to census-based from July 1, 21 until July 1, 22, and to delay the requirement uh, that certain approved independent schools enroll students on IEPs from July 1, 22 until July 1, 2023. Uh, if we move down, Avery, um, the other thing this bill does, it's not in the statement of purpose, but there are certain te technical changes that the AOE had requested, um, which are here as well. Uh, and they were in your bill last year as well. So um, the first change here, um, just clarifying that the definition of long-term membership, which is used to compute the uniform base amount, um, clarifying that it's for um, the most recent three, years, three school years for which that are available. That is a technical change from the AOE. If we scroll down to the next language that's been underlined or struck right here on line 14. Uh, this is just now using, using that definition of long-term membership uh, um, rather than restating it again. And then going down further, now we're getting into date changes. So this says that for fiscal year 23 now, um, this, that's the first year of the grant funding. Um, so it's moving, moving from 21 to 23. Uh, will be the average amount the SU received in three fiscal years, moving from 17, 18, 19 to 18, 19, and 20. So the average those three years. Uh, and then moves down further, Avery, if you would. Uh, and then increase by, except there if you could, sorry, go back up. 
Avery, sorry. Uh, right there, stop. Great, right, thanks. So that, that's increased by um, on line three through six by an inflator. And then um, the amount determined uh, there is then divided by the SU's uh, ADM count, long-term membership. So that's how you get to a place where the first year you've got basically uh, grant funding equaling the last year or the average of the last three years. And then you're dividing that by the your student count to get to a grant per student uh, for that SU, which again will be very different uh, across the state. And then if you go down further, Avery to line 11. Yep, great, thanks. Um, in 27, that's the very end, end of the phase then. So in fiscal year 27 and subsequent fiscal years, the census grant should be, be the uniform base amount uh, multiplied, multiplied, multiplied by the SU's long-term membership. So again, that's now getting us to the place where everybody's got the same uh, amount per student. Um, and, and that carries on going forward and there's no inflator on that. And the reason there's no inflator on that is that's where you were over time, there could be some savings, uh, fiscal savings uh, in, in this area. Then uh, line 14 says, what happens to those years in between the first year uh, in, 20, in 23 and uh, fiscal year 27? That's when you're moving toward the uniform base rate. So uh, for fiscal years 24, 25, and 26, the amount of the assistance grant uh, should be determined by multiplying the SU's student count by a base amount um, established under this subdivision and the base amount for each SU under this subdivision will move gradually the SU's uh, fiscal 23 base amount to the uniform base amount in 27. So if we go on further, Avery, um, keep going if you would, yep, right, right there is good. Um, yeah, and that's all that's saying at the top of the page. So that's the key, key provision here in this bill is how the, those mechanics work. Uh, the next section, section two, um, is making changes to uh, recommend by AOE. These are technical changes because we're not operating under the reimbursement system, but under their grant, census grant system. So rather than re referring to expenditures, we're referring to funding. So it's just a technical word change uh, throughout this uh, section. So move forward, Avery, to section three. Yep, great. Uh, pause here. This is the unusual um, uh, special education cost. So historically, there has been a 2% bucket that the secretary can use for unusual circumstances. And now that bucket, that 2% is being tied to the um, census grant amount, uh, as opposed to the amount that was sent out in reimbursement. So the language has changed to reflect census funding here. Uh, and again, that came from AOE as a technical change. Uh, section four, uh, rulemaking. Uh, you, you see in the chart that um, this was changed. So uh, rulemaking has to be in place now uh, before August 1, 2021. And then scroll down further, if you would. Uh, section five, keep going, if you would. Yep. Uh, date changes here. So. There are some transitional requirements in Act 173. So um, usually uh, SUs have to give a service plan to the secretary. So they have a sense for how much reimbursement um, to expect, uh, but that, that's going away. So no service plan is required um, for fiscal year 23, um, uh, but uh, they are required to have a, um, to give the sector information by November 1, 2021, so that the sector can estimate the projected um, extraordinary special education reimbursement that still exists um, under the assistance grant, and also uh, to report for IDEA, IDEA. And then section six below, uh, that is, uh, pause there if you would. Uh, in Act 173, there is a transition that allowed uh, teachers to teach a prior group of students um, who weren't on IEPs, um, so as to combine them with other students who are struggling. Um, that was a temporary measure until we went to the assistance grant. 
that's being repealed, uh, regulatory census grant comes into place. So that date's been moved forward as well to July 1, 2022. And this goes on further, if you would, Avery. Um, yeah, this is the end. So now um, the effective dates in uh, Act 73 are being changed. So Section 5, which is the whole heart of 173, um, will take effect now in, uh, on July 1, 2022 for fiscal 23. Um, and then uh, the requirements for independent schools uh, is being moved from uh, July 1, 22 to 23. And uh, that's it. Sorry, and nothing about a waiting study. No. I, <laughs> no. Sorry, that was like swearing. Um, so in terms of people that are here that could respond, first of all, are there any questions from the committee about this? Just where does the waiting study fit in, maybe not to this bill, but what happens in terms of a timeline or has that been thought out or do we discuss that? Or have any idea at this point, or There's does that need a much? Yeah. So I can tell you two things. One is there was a bill uh, proposed in the Senate, which would have um, required that the AOE work in conjunction with other parties to develop an um, implementation plan uh, for the new weights um, using one of the uh, scenarios in that report uh, as oh. the was that the task force? It was, it was a task force. It was, I believe it was, I think it was the AOE working in conjunction with a number of other other interested parties. I don't think it was formally a task force. Okay. I don't know if you're wrong on that, but I think, I think that's the way it went down. But um, more broadly, uh, the way study did talk about whether the census grant should be increased for um, districts that have a particularly high level of students who struggle um maybe using uh poverty as a, as a proxy um but um so there is there's an aspect there that hasn't been determined yet the, the, the recommendation that sam was going with um in terms of having an implementation plan would, would not have um increased the census grant uh for students who struggle um it would, it would have excluded that part of it. So, but of course that's not moving forward at this stage either. So nothing's happening at this stage that I know of. I'm gonna to try to get us through. Um, and I, I think what I'll do is just, we'll get testimony. We're gonna bring this up again on Tuesday where we're gonna have more people in for testimony. And Jim, you're gonna be able to join us, I'm assuming. Yep. Yeah. So um, do we have here to testify? We have Megan Roy. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Looking for your response to this bill as drafted from the advisor. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm here as the chair of the Act 173 advisory group. Um, just as an aside, Kate, the written testimony that you have does cover a couple of other things, but I'm gonna stick to the 173 part since I know this is at the end of your conversation. Um, so the Act 173 Census-Based Funding Advisory Group um, has not formally met to discuss the issue of delay. However, they've all had an opportunity to review the draft legislation um, as well as the Agency of Education's considerations document that they had shared last week in Senate Ed. Um, so what I'm sharing today is a summary of the individual feedback of the group. Um, the advisory group does support a delay in the shift to a census-based funding model as outlined in the uh, committee's draft. Um, given the unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 crisis for the foreseeable future, districts are singularly focused on managing through the various and significant implications of the school closure and the significant financial implications that will follow. Uh, the enormity of this unexpected impact on both the programmatic and financial workings of schools makes it nearly impossible to simultaneously manage Act 173. Uh, in particular, the members of the group have considered the following. Um, the first is professional learning. So your committee has heard previous testimony uh, from the advisory group about the significant professional learning impact on schools to effectively implement Act 173's programmatic parts. 
Um, the legislation has already been acknowledged to be landmark legislation requiring significant change at all levels of the educational system. Um, the advisory group was already concerned about a lack of available professional learning opportunities, um, about the systematic implementation of MTSS, um, and was already advocating for the agency to clearly identify a coherent and sustained professional development plan. None of that is has changed that's all still true um, but what has changed is the unexpected and fundamental shift that's occurred in schools due to the school closure uh, districts have undergone a complete redesign of the delivery of education including special education uh, in a matter of weeks and they'll continue to iterate redesign and adjust throughout the course of the next several months and into the next school year um, it won't be feasible for schools to simultaneously continue that professional learning um, alongside what would be required to implement Act 173. So this delay in legislation will ensure more time for districts to implement as well as more time for the agency to support that implementation. Um, the second consideration is financial. Um, Act 173 was already poised to have significant impacts on the amount of state funding for special education that districts received. Uh, in the lead up to the statewide calculation of the grant amount, uh, roughly half of Vermont schools stood to receive less state funding in support of special ed, and in some cases significantly less. Um, further, you mentioned the waiting study um, that prompted early discussion about possible changes to the calculation of the census grant. Um, modeling in the waiting study illustrated other significant impacts on special ed funding and overall tax rates. Both of those realities now coincide with the additional and more severe financial impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. A delay in this shift to a census-based funding model would provide additional time to consider both of these financial impacts simultaneously. Um, a couple of specific things that we would, that, um, we would like to mention, uh, for the first is around rulemaking. Uh, the group supports the identified delay in the effective date of revised special ed funding rules. Um, the committee is probably aware that the 1300 series and 26, 2360 series um, are currently open for public comment. Uh, the group has communicated to the state board about the importance of that public comment and the impact that the current stay home, stay safe order will have on the ability of the public to participate in that. Um, so. The, the advisory group feels it's important to, to make sure that public comment period exists. So um, hoping that the delay in implementation that's in this bill would allow the state board to be able to extend the public comment period. Uh, one piece that's not in, in this version um, that we would want the committee to be aware of is the existence and function of the Act 173 advisory group. Um, the current bill doesn't address this. Uh, given the myriad of issues facing districts as they implement on a delayed timeline, the advisory group remains an essential voice for stakeholders. Um, it's essential that the proposed legislation include language that sustains the advisory group and adjusts the frequency of meetings so that the group has the time that they need. This was actually something we were going to come to your committee with, um, irregardless of the school closure. Um, our group would recommend that the committee include language from a previous bill that directed the group to meet up to 12 times per year, um, provide uh, funds to support reimbursement for that amount of meetings, and to continue that until the uh, implementation date, which uh, is what the original bill intended, was that the group would exist uh, until the grant is in place. Um, so we would recommend that. Okay. Um, and I have one more thing to add that was that was actually, it, it's uh, you can read it in more detail later, but um, so this has to do with the waiting study. Um, it's really important uh, to recognize that we have the fundamental shift of moving to a census grant. Um, the implications of the waiting study were already understood to be potentially a redesign of our ed funding system in Vermont, or at least it raised those questions. And now we have a, a critical challenge coming related to education funding and what's available to schools. And it, I, I, my recommendation um, and, and the individual perspectives of the group members that, um, that I've connected with is just to recognize the magnitude of those things together. Um, 
this isn't just, this is no longer just a conversation about how we calculate special ed funding. It's potentially a conversation about how we calculate or how we consider ed funding in general. So uh, we would just uh, emphasize that the conversation not be about each one of those pieces, but that it's the pieces we were dealing with before and the, and the pieces that we're dealing with now. Um, so happy to take questions. Questions? Okay, I, hey, Kate, I do. A, I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, it's just uh, Megan brought up the uh, uh, an earlier version of the bill that did have a continuation of the uh, of the committee with funding attached to it. And I guess this is more for Jim than anybody else. I was curious to know what happened to that. Uh, that was part of a different bill, I believe. It was uh, a different bill. Yeah, I think the advisory group is being used for a different function. I forgot what oh, was. thank you, thank you. That's right. That's right. Okay, um, I think what I'm going to do is we're going to take this up again on Tuesday. Um, Avery's working on that. So the people that are here, I think what I'm going to do. I just is there anybody else that's outside of the legislature that wanted to testify that's here? I know I can get Tracy. I can get Jay. I can get you guys on on Tuesday. I think. I'm just conscious of the time and, and a request to end, end on time. Is that okay? All right. So um, with that, I, I think we're, I thank you so much, Megan. Have you spoken no to the Senate yet? Have you testified before the Senate? Not yet. Okay. Um, I'll, I'm gonna speak with the Senator this afternoon, so we'll see what, what happens. Um, so I guess with that, we can end the meeting. I just want to do a little, little check in after. So, um, but the formal meeting is is over. So thank you. Did we want to hear from Dylan for a moment or two? Yeah. Yeah. I think we do.